In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, teens, you can be released. I don't know exactly what the scripture is, um, but it says that in heaven, the throne of God is encircled by angels. And the only thing they do in all of eternity, all they've ever been created to do, was to sing holy, holy, holy. I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't say this for anybody else, but I can say it for myself. I don't know if I understand how holy God is. I, have, I think I have an idea, but it's, it's really so shallow compared to what it really... I mean, think about it. Angels have never experienced anything like we have. They've never left his side, and all they do is look at him and say, holy, 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 holy. That's all they do for eternity. <laughs> and I'm, I, I hope you don't take this as judgmental. But when I sing these songs and I talk about the holiness of God, I'm like, what the heck am I even doing? <laughs> like, do I even understand how holy God is? He's so good. Wow. It's moments like those that just absolutely wreck me. Ah. We're so spoiled. <laughs> we really, I told my kids the other day, I'm like, you're so spoiled. <laughs> but then I look at everybody else that's more spoiled than them, and I'm like, they're probably looking at me like, this is spoiled? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, that wasn't quite the introduction I wanted to give, but that's, that's all right. I, uh, when, I, when I think about uh, when I'm doing sermon prep, and I'll just kind of give you a little peek into my window here, into my life, uh, one of the hardest and most difficult things for me to do in sermon prep is come up with a title. When when we had to record, uh, when we when we shut down a couple of years ago for COVID, and we had to do all of our different recordings, and Jessica would come in and she would record, and we had this little routine of things that we had to do, ways that we had to do it, and things like that, because we were learning. Everybody was thrown into a new learning curve, you know, during COVID. You had to figure out different things, and I could go through all types of different things, and every single time she's like. You didn't give me a title. I'm like, ah, oh, man, that's the hardest part. Like, what's the title? And if, if, you, if you don't know, you'll probably find out if you, if you stick around very long. I don't hardly ever come up with a churchy title. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I'm not all the way saved yet. I don't know if it's the fact that maybe my mind hasn't totally been transformed yet and renewed. But like... I just don't do churchy titles. And I'm just being open to it. When I, when I go and click on different messages for Jensen Franklin or whoever it is, and if it's a churchy title, it literally turns me off. I, I'm just saying who I am, okay? Don't sit there and look at me like that. You got, <laughs> you got some funky stuff too, all right? <laughs> but, like if I see like saved by the blood, ooh, that gets me. But I'm like, eh, saved by the blood. That's kind of like you couldn't come up with anything better than that. I'm like, come on, you know? I don't know. It's just, like sometimes I will literally go see a movie based on the title, not on the trailer. I know it's it's weird. I heard two people laugh, so it means you're a freak just like me. That's awesome. And so today it was weird because I had 13 different titles for today's message, and so I'm like, oh. Now what do I do? And not a single one of them was churchy. So we're going we're gonna to get into it today, and uh, we'll see where God takes us. But uh, I, I, I want to give you the title before I get too far into this. Um, today's title is Get in the Game. Anybody remember EA Sports? Get in the game. 
Okay, a couple of us, a couple of us old gamers in here. Get in the game. Um, and so how fitting it is for Super Bowl Sunday, right? Get in the game. Did you guys know that, how many of you have ever read scripture and you're like, oh my gosh, God is talking to me right now, right where I'm at. Like he must have written this scripture for me thousands of years ago, right? And for those of you that are sports fans, and a couple of you, a couple of you got the, 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 the clue to wear your sports gear. And just so you know, I know the Titans aren't in the Super Bowl, okay? And the Titans aren't even my team. It's not even my jersey. I don't, I don't own a, a sports jersey, so I had to borrow one to, to fit in today. Um, but, uh, and for those of you that have felt that it was necessary to contact me personally and let me know that Walter Payton didn't play for the Cubs. Uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate you reaching out. And uh, just be on guard. Those of you that reached out to me and pointed out my faults, my eyes are sharpened. I'm looking for them. No, I'm just kidding. No, I get a little carried away and, and, and speed up sometimes. And sometimes that's why I tell you oftentimes don't take everything that I say from this pulpit as 100% gospel because I'm human. I'll get messed up. I'll tell you that Elijah walked on water and Moses built a boat. It doesn't, <laughs> sometimes I just get going and you mix some things up. So, and just so you know, I do that on purpose so that you guys will go get in the word of God for yourself. Forgive me, Father. I'm, I'm lying. That's not true. Um, but did you know that, that God, uh, in, in, in all of his infinite wisdom and being able to see all things, he, he's, he is at all times, everywhere at all times. He saw past, present, and future at the same time. We can't comprehend that. But did you realize that God gave us scriptures for the Super Bowl this year? How many, how many uh, uh, Eagles fans we got in here today? Great, we have a holiness church. We don't believe in sports at all. Any, does that, either that means that no one's willing to step up and say, yeah, they're my team, or you're all Chiefs fans. How many Chiefs fans? Okay, we've got a couple brave ones. Okay, all right. So uh, if you can put uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, Thou shalt mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's go, Eagles. Yeah. All right. But what, 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 what's it say about the Chiefs? In Job chapter 12, it says, He takes away the understanding of the Chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. I have given you the forecast for the Super Bowl this year. The Eagles will walk away victorious as the Chiefs wander. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many of you know it's okay to have fun in church sometimes? How many of you also know that some crazy moron, no, sorry, some crazy fanatical person's probably going to watch this on YouTube and say, oh, that pastor takes things out of context. <laughs> yes, I do. I did that on purpose. Watch the whole thing. You'll get there. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, let me move on quickly before I get in the flesh and say something I don't mean to say. I want to give you a couple of points today. Um, I thought, uh, as I kept trying to move away from things, I ended up back in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Some of you should have a pretty good indent in your Bible by now, uh, if you've been bringing it uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So let's, let's pull that scripture up. Um, maybe you're using your phones or whatever. And at the very end of 1 Samuel chapter 17 of the battle of David versus Goliath, it says, So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Verse 51, it says, Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their, or the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Heavenly Father, I ask now that you would use your words to speak through me today. Lord, let, let my own flesh get out of the way and let your Holy Spirit reign and rule in this house. I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us and change us with the words that come forth today. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the words that are written in your word, in your Bible, in your book, in your letter to us, oh God, Lord, would leap off the pages and land in our heart and produce much fruit in the days and weeks and months to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we've, we've been building this story, pulling from all types of different uh, portions of Scripture of, of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and giving you multiple different angles to look at. And one of the reasons I decided to kind of stick with this, one is because of Super Bowl Sunday and like how much, I mean, how many times did I reference David and Goliath is often used in sports analogies. And I'm like, how can I go on Super Bowl Sunday and not mention David and Goliath? I've been doing it for six weeks now. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this a little bit more. But um, there, there's so many things to pull out of this story that uh, I, I thought it would be good to pull some more stuff out of it. And one of the reasons I decided to stay there is because several of you over the last couple of weeks have, have come to me personally and either messaged me or, or talked to me face to face and told me that how much you got out of the message and, or you hadn't seen that before and God was really speaking to you right where it was at. And I love that about God because he can take a room of this size and take anyone who maybe doesn't know anything about him or someone who has been well-versed for years and years and years in Scripture and drop a nugget and something will, will spark to them and he can speak to them even out of uh, all of that. And he can do it at the same time. And we see it happen in the book of Acts when the disciples came down and it said that they began to, uh, to prophesy and, and speak of what was happening. And it, it said every nation and tribe was represented there, but there was one man that was speaking, but yet every single person heard what he was saying in their language. God, when God intervenes, when the Holy Spirit empowers man to speak his word, it does something the natural man can't do. The very man who denied Christ then stood up in front of thousands and gave a, a salvation message that changed and, and, and ignited the church. That's a, that's a pretty significant change. That's a, that's a turnaround, right? But I want to give you uh, some things today. Hopefully, I'll give you a, a couple of steps towards victory, or as the, uh, the Gen Z and the millennials call it, a cheat code. Awesome. That means we got an old congregation right now because none of you even understood what that meant. Jenny already called you old in worship, so she already offended you. I didn't just offend you. Just kidding. Now, I want to give you some cheat codes to victory today. Some simple things, but I think there's, there's some truth in it that we can grab a hold of. Some, some things that David understood, and we can relate all the way through Scripture and see how God is speaking to us today. And number one, if we look at this, where... Uh, for those of you that have been here for a while, when Goliath came, uh, they were in a valley. You remember that? They were in a valley. They were on both sides of the valley. Okay? And I think many of us today are in, that same, are in a valley ourselves, a valley of indecision, trying to decide what are we going to do, what, uh, what is God asking me to do, what's my job asking me to do, should I get married, should I tithe, should I do this, whatever it could be, a valley of indecision. But I want to talk to you about some things because it's in that valley that you can't get victory if you stay in a valley of indecision. And many of us are wanting victory, we're longing for victory, but yet we're in a valley of indecision. And sometimes we just have to move, right? I don't know about you, but I often want God to move miraculously without me having to do anything, right? I'm like, Lord, you come and do what only you can do. Yes, I just sit here and watch, right? I want to be one of the angels and just watch you orchestrate heaven and creation. And I just want to sit here and watch you do what you do because you do it so well. And if I get involved, I'm more than likely going to screw it up. No one else feels that way. Okay, awesome. You guys all feel like when God tells you to do something, you're going to conquer it and you're going to do it to the best of your ability, which is what we should do. That's what we, how we should operate. But oftentimes we get in our own head but in the valley of indecision, there is no victory. And what happens is oftentimes what we do is, so often what the enemy does in our mind is we'll get to that place and we don't make a decision thinking that if I don't make a decision, I can't mess it up. And so oftentimes what we do is, well, I just don't know or I, I, I'm not sure if that's right. I haven't read any scripture specifically on that one thing. And we kind of sit in this place and we're like, well, if I don't make any decisions, then I don't do anything wrong. Anybody ever done that one? Yes. Yes. Right? Now, you know that, that I often get myself in trouble uh, behind the pulpit and I'll probably do so again today, but it's Super Bowl Sunday, so I'll be surrounded by friends and loved ones. But <laughs> husbands, I, I may be speaking to you today. 
How many of you have ever got into that situation when you're with your wife and you know there's something you should say or do, but you just don't know what it is? And you fall into the trap of illusionment that says, if I just don't say anything or do anything, maybe I'll just slide right on by. <sighs> have any of you noticed how I have not yet made eye contact with my wife? <laughs> and and I, will, I will continue to stay that way until probably the end of the message when I feel like I've redeemed myself, right? But no, don't. I mean, you can think about that in, in all kinds of different ways. Maybe it's on your job. Maybe it's in, in trying to raise your kids. Um, we had a situation the other day where our kids were asking us to do something. And I just, I, we didn't really have a piece about it, but we also didn't have like any of that firm ground that said, no, this is why. You know, like there's sometimes that you can give a good reason of, of why you've said what you've said. And then there's times you just don't know, but it's like, uh, I, ooh, I, ooh. right? <laughs> and you're just kind of there. And, and uh, you know, sometimes that's what we do in, in, in life. Sometimes that's what we do in the church. I believe there's probably many of you sitting in the church today that feel an unctioning or a, or a pull that you're supposed to be more involved or do something in church, but you just don't know what. And so you sit in a valley of indecision. But then often what happens is if you sit in the valley long enough, it becomes a valley of bitterness. Because then you gripe and complain because the church isn't using you or you haven't been touched or you haven't been moved or this and that and that, right? And so we're in this place... <laughs> Uh, in this valley of indecision. And I love this thing because David gives us a few things that, it, that if we kind of look through the scripture there, if we, if, we could, if we could go through the entire story, you could probably pull out a whole lot more, but I'm just going to give you a couple. Number one, whenever you're in this valley of indecision, you've got to choose a team. Pretty simple, right? You've got to choose a team. You've got you to figure out which team you're on. Who, you know, if you watch the Super Bowl today, some of you may literally just be watching because of the, the, the ads, the commercials, okay? Because they're like $7 million, so they better be really good. You know, you put a, I mean, some movies don't even have a $7 million budget, but they're charging you $7 million for a 30-second commercial this year. You know, it's, it better be on point, right? It better be good. And it's much the same way I used to watch NASCAR. I only watched for the accidents, I didn't really care who won. I just wanted to see a good wreck, you know. And uh, I, uh, all NASCAR fans usually start throwing things at me, booing me, lighting my emails up. Uh, you know, how dare you? But we, we look at these things, and, and I want to I get to this. I'm going to pull out several different scriptures today. I don't know if I'll, I'll read all of them, uh, but, but I'll, I'll go through a couple of them. Go, uh, if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, you've got to choose a team. You gotta know who you're fighting for. Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? He was talking to Israel. How, how long are you going to keep trying to live a double sided life? How long are you gonna keep leaning to this way of thinking or to this God's opinion? Or are you gonna stand for what God has done in your life, for who He's called you to be? And He's challenging them. Elijah was challenging them on how long are you going to waver? Many of us today waver back and forth. Am I really going to sell out to God or am I going to just barely get involved? I believe in him, but I'm not selling out. I'm, I, I'll do this, but I won't do that. We're wavering between two opinions. We're wavering between, well, this looks good for my life, but I feel like he's calling me over here. I believe that today he's talking to you right now. I believe that there's several of you here today that it, this is hitting hard in your heart because you know you've been called and anointed and appointed to do something in the kingdom, but you're sitting in the valley of indecision. Just like the Israelites, they sat on their side in the valley of indecision because it was comfortable. It was bushy. It had, it had coverage. I believe that there was, I don't know, I wasn't there. Anybody here? Anybody, anybody been there? Like, was anybody there when David came? Okay, cool. I know there's some old people here today, but I just don't know. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Man. <laughs> Send all your hate mail to j.greenwood. <laughs> no. No, seriously. We weren't there. We're, you know, we're taking all these commentaries. We're taking all this stuff. 
and we're trying to draw conclusions on, on what was there thousands of years ago. And, and we're looking at this thing, and, and we see that there was probably some comfort there. There was some provision there. For one, they were actually in the country, that God, in the land that God had given them. Right, So we know that there was supernatural provision there, and so it may get comfortable there. It may be okay. Like You may be in the church today, and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've been baptized. Maybe, maybe you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you can quote a few scriptures. Maybe you even have a favorite one tattooed on you somewhere. But, but you know that God is calling you to a greater measure. He's wanting you to do something else, but it, you realize, hey, that's going to cost me something. It doesn't get easy, and there's some fear that begins to strike in. And so just like Elijah, he said, how long will you waver? I believe David could probably kind of take that same idea as he heard Goliath come and chant his normal taunts and sit there and watch all these trained warriors. What What are you guys doing? Like, you're trained for battle. This is your job. Why are you just sitting here? And why am I a young boy who's only a shepherd boy fired up about this, right? How many of you have ever seen some people get fired up over something and you're like, why are they so fired up about Like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm one of those guys, I can go to somebody else's game and watch it. And if I stay there long enough, I'll get fired up. I don't know what I'm getting fired up about, but I'll get into it, right? And... <laughs> But you got to choose. you got to choose what you're going to do. And it, oftentimes what it's easy to do, it's easy to stay on the outside and make complaints about why nothing's happening. I, the, several of the things that I've got involved in in my life is because I've made some determinations in my own life that I'm not going to sit there and complain about something if i got free time, ability, and effort to do something about it. It's great that I can, I can sit here and sideline coach, but I also have some free time. I also have a kid. I also have whatever. You know, I have some training. Why don't I get involved and see if I can turn the situation around? I think that's what happens in our world. I think that's what's happening in our country. We've got a lot of Christians who can sit around and complain about everything that's happening, but yet we won't show up to the polls. We won't go to the city meetings. We won't talk about how good God is. We only talk about how bad the world is. And so we look at this thing and we, we realize there's some things that's happening. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, uh, oh man, you guys are on it today. That's awesome. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. Is that all of it? Okay. Come out from among them. we got too many Christians in the world today that are trying to just blend in. I don't know about you, but there's, there's been some times where I've been at a place and I can tell that there is no godly influence in the place. It could be Diamonds, it could be Walmart, it could be Casey's, it could be Farm Fleet. I'm not telling you where, I'm just saying, how many of you have ever been in a situation and you can tell by the conversation, you, you have enough discernment of spirit that you can tell that what's happening around you, there's not a godly presence there. And what most of us do, I shouldn't say that because I don't know. I haven't asked you. Most of the time what I do, I'm like, they need Jesus. <laughs> or I will do this. I'm like, God, you need to show up over there. Like, you just, need to, you just need to strike them down right now. Or, man, you just need to send somebody over there and they can start laying hands on them <laughs> while I'm sitting right here <laughs> in my cushy valley, <laughs> in, the, in the valley of indecision. Right? And wondering, why doesn't God do something? We keep wanting God to pour out revival like we're starting to see in some places, but when was the last time we actually sacrificed for revival? <laughs> Jenny has done this for me before, and it's not about Jenny. Notice I still haven't made eye contact with her. <laughs> but there are times when I get hungry. I know, it's surprising. <laughs> and I'll be like, do we have anything to eat? And she'll like list off a whole bunch of things. Anybody ever been in that mood? Like, it doesn't matter what she lists, it's not the right thing. Like, she could have literally just come from the store and bought the entire Kroger store, put it in our refrigerators and said, is there any of that you want? Mm, it just doesn't quite hit the spot, right? And then she'll like, well, if you want something, go get it. 
Any, any husband ever heard those words before? Yeah. Why didn't I not see a single man raise their hand? Only a woman <laughs> said yes. <laughs> I must be the only one. But then what I'll do is like, but I don't want to. Like, I'm comfortable right here. It would be so nice. Like, if you just served it to me. And that's how so many of us live our Christian life. We're sitting in the blessings and the promises of God. We don't have anything major attacking us or hurting us right now. But we're in that place where like, ooh, I just want some more. <laughs> I saw, the, I saw the, the videos of the revival, and I've, I've read lots of uh, reports and, and things on this revival that's starting to break out at Asbury College. And I'm like, Lord, that is so awesome. That is fantastic. And then I found myself longing for what they had when the whole time I've been touched and blessed just like they have. But what am I doing to actively seek where they're at? And then I began to think, God, am I just wanting that touch or am I really wanting you? Because, see, sometimes what we do is we, we want, we want the, the, the goodness of God and all the blessings of God, but we don't really want to sacrifice to get into his presence. It's kind of like sometimes when your kid comes up to you and they're being super nice. This happens a lot between the ages of, of like 12 and 20. And they'll come and they'll, they'll just kind of hang out in the room for a little bit. Or maybe they'll give you a hug and like, hey, mom, what are you doing today? <laughs> Dad, is there anything you need right now? I'm like, what? Like, you want me to get you a tea? I'm like, you want me to rub your ankles? Like, like who is this? <laughs> right? <laughs> get behind me, Satan. <laughs> no, um, just kidding. I've never said that. Um, you, you know, but like all of a sudden you sense like, wait a second, there's something different coming. And it's not really that they care what I want. They just want to know, do I have anything in my pocket that I can give to them at the moment, right? And uh, unfortunately, there's been a few times that they found their way into my pocket when dad wasn't around and I show up at the store to pay for something. And I'm like, uh-oh, someone has found their way into my pocket, and they, they steal, right? As I used to tell my mom when I, when I stole, I, I don't remember how much it was, but it was a lot of quarters to play video games. Anybody remember Centipede? <laughs> Centipede's of the devil. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was right down the street. From, anybody remember a store called Tolly's? Yeah, like as you went into Tolly's, they had Miss Pac-Man, Galaga, and Centipede. I probably have a 401k in those games somewhere, <laughs> right? I need some return, some ROI, some return on investment. Uh, but I told my mom one time, she went, she, they'd been saving up for something. I don't remember what it was. And they, they, she had this thing hidden in her closet of quarters. And I would go in there and I'm like, I just need two quarters. Back then, a game was only a quarter. Do you guys know what a quarter is? <laughs> you don't have quarters on plastic right now. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and it was a quarter. I'm like, I just need a couple games. Well, then like some friends came with me. I'm like, oh, I've got to have more than two quarters. I mean, there's four of us. Like, and so what ended up happening is like I, the intention was I'm just going to borrow these and I'll pay it back when I mow or scoop snow or whatever. Until all of a sudden the debt became too big and it was overwhelming, Right. And then it was like, Rusty, did you get in my quarters? What? You have quarters? The valley of indecision, right? <laughs> Make a choice. Did you or didn't you? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> you probably got a mouse somewhere. You probably ate a hole and just falling into the basement. I don't know. No. Um, but we're in those things, and we wonder sometimes, why are we sitting in a situation experiencing what we're experiencing? But it's because we're in the valley of indecision. God has not called us to sit. He's called us to become an active member of the kingdom. And, and there's many different things that you can do. We sang about it earlier. If you're not dead, he's not done. I truly, truly, truly believe that. That if you're still living and breathing, God has something for you to do. It may not be in this house, but it could be for the kingdom of God. You never know who you can touch and who you can minister to. And we believe, we want to be at the place where every single member of this church is serving in some capacity, what, in one way or another. That they're finding their place in the kingdom of God, being used 
for his glory. And so we see there that that it says to come out from among them. Paul tells us to the Christians, he said, look, stop living that double lifestyle. Come out from among them. Whenever you come out and and you separate, all of a sudden there's, there's an extra level of responsibility that's put on you. You can't hide anymore. I can remember uh, way back in my teen years, it was way back, right? And God had begun to, to shift and change some things in my life. And I was living one lifestyle and God was pulling me closer and closer to him. And I, I had a hunger and a desire for him, but I also enjoyed what I was doing. Anybody remember those days of, of being a sinner, right? You enjoyed the sin you were in, but you knew that, that there was more to life. And so I was in that place, and, and uh, I can't remember exactly what happened <coughs> excuse me, in my life, but something had changed to the, the next time I went out with that same group of people, they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm here to party, man. Like, let's get it on. Let's go. And they're like, you can't be with us. <gasps> what? They found, they found me out. I couldn't live the double lifestyle anymore. They rejected me. The rejects rejected me. <laughs> There's none of them here today, so I can say that. I hope you're not watching online. Um, but, but you know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, you, you've stepped out, and you, you may, may not be all the way out, but you've stepped out from among them, and all of a sudden, you've made yourself, uh, re- you've revealed yourself to a level, and then things begin to happen, and you have to make a decision. And that's what happens next in David uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 to 47. And we're not, we're not going to take time to read it uh, for the sake of time, but we've been talking about this. I think it, it's pretty amazing. I'm guessing the way that I've read the scripture, the way that I've read the battle, the chant that David gives back to Goliath is probably longer than the battle actually lasted. I think that's pretty cool. Because sometimes we get so caught up in thinking, man, this is going to cost me whatever. This is going to be so hard. This is going to be so difficult, blah, 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 blah. And we go into this thing, and David begins to come at Goliath, and he begins to say back to him with confidence who God is. If you'll remember, if we look into that, it wasn't about how awesome David was. David talks about how awesome he was to Saul to convince him. Remember, he said, don't fear. I've had a bear come after a, after a lamb, and I've had a lion come after one of the, one of the sheep. And, and I've, I've attacked them and taken, taken the sheep back, and I've killed the lion and the bear. Right? He's bragging about his, I don't want to say bragging in the way that we think about it today, but he's confident in his ability because he has practiced something. Anybody ever heard, the, I don't know what the exact term is, but it's kind of the, the, it's the power of 10,000. And it talks about 10,000 hours. Anybody ever heard of that? In order to master something, it takes 10,000 hours. They've kind of computed it down to 10,000 hours to become a master at something. And a lot of, I've heard so many people talk about that, that David was able to defeat Goliath because he, of his mastery of, of the slingshot. Do you realize that if you broke 10,000 hours down over a teenage boy's life that he would have had to have practiced with his slingshot? like six and a half or seven hours every single day? It's impossible. He couldn't have become a master at the slingshot at the age that he was according to today's standards. Okay? Which, again, for me, proves that it was the power of God, the anointing of God, that took what he gave to God, used it to kill Goliath. But he was talking about in, in some, some confidence. And see, sometimes what we, we don't understand is we get, we get some things mixed up. We get, we get two things confused. And I, I don't remember where I'm at in my notes, so I'm, I'm stumbling over my words here for, for a second. But there, there's a difference between confidence and courage. And I've heard people say, use those two words about David so often. And I don't think they're interchangeable. Because you can have courage without confidence. And you can have confidence without courage. They're not the same thing. Courage is something that rises up inside of you when things are out of normal 
uh, when fear begins to take over. There's something inside of you that raises up. We just saw some of these things in some of the shootings that we've had recently. And, and I think it was in one of the college towns or something, they interviewed a, a young man. And they said, why did you do what you did? And he said, I don't know. I didn't know what to do, but I knew that I couldn't let him just keep doing what he was doing, so I acted. That's courage. He didn't know how to defend or to deflect or to get a weapon away, but he knew that if I don't do something, other people are going to get hurt. So courage overtook him, and he operated in courage. Sometimes that happens to us spiritually. Sometimes there, we see something happen, and we just, we just respond. But I think what happens most of the time is we don't respond because we don't have confidence. And the difference in confidence is you have confidence in something greater than you. Like, I have confidence that that chair is going to hold me when I sit in it. I have placed my confidence in something else. And I believe that David had confidence in who his God was because when he gave his 100-word speech, approximately in English, to Goliath, he talked about how God was going to deliver him, how God was going to do this. Who are you to come against God? He didn't talk about, dude, do you know how many hours I've got on this slingshot? He wasn't confident in his ability. He was confident in who his God was. See, David began to attack Goliath based on the fact that he understood God's covenant. He understood God's word. And if we'll, we'll look at some more scripture here as we move back into this thing, because you, once you choose a team, you have to get in the game. It's one thing to pick a team, but you've got to get in the game. And I think to, today our world is begging and crying out for us to get in the game. Our world is at a place where it's time for the church to get in the game. We've been talking about it for so long, sitting on the sidelines and, and, and bragging about how awesome we are. Anybody ever know that person that like, they brag on themselves all the time, and you get to wondering, like, something don't line up. And you get to that place where like, prove it. Anybody ever have that? <laughs> like you have somebody telling you they can do something, and they can do this, and they can do that, and you're like, Really? That don't make sense. Let me see. <laughs> have, you, have you guys ever called that person out like that? And usually what happens is like, well, you see what had happened was, um, well, um, <laughs> and they, they kind of they start stumbling over themselves, or they do the really, really dumb thing. Okay. And then they try it and make a fool of themselves, right? <laughs> I like it when those happen because now they make reels of it and you can just sit on, on, your, on your phone and just watch them over and over and over. Fails, watching people fail. I love doing that. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it, 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 takes, it takes the attention off my own failures, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're so silly. Why'd you do that? And I don't have to think about what I just failed at, right? But we have to get in the game. And, and we look in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8, eight and 9. How do, how do you have confidence when you get in the game. Uh, it says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about all the horrible things that can happen if you don't accomplish it. And what are they going to say? No, 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 no. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Don't think about what's going to happen if you don't do something. Fix your thoughts on what God said will happen. Fix your thoughts on what God has already set in motion, what God has already proven for you in the, in the past. Fix your thoughts on those things, and then all of a sudden you begin to get confident in what God has already done for you. You've got some things that God has done in your life. More than likely, is if we get into worship and we, and we get into that time of reflection, there's probably many of us that get overwhelmed sometimes at how many times God has been there for us. And we, so I don't know about you, but sometimes I come into church, and again, I got to quit telling you all my secrets. But sometimes I come into the church, and I feel like, God doesn't love me anymore. Well, kind of like Elijah hiding in the cave. I'm the only one left, right? Oh, man, I must be the only person that struggles with this stuff today. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for some, some, some company in my misery, and you guys aren't helping me. Right. But anybody ever come to church like you just go out of habit, you go out of you, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, but you're really not all the way in it. And you're looking for something to happen in your life. But this says that we're supposed to fix our thoughts on what is true. 
what is honorable, what is right, pure and lovely. You may be in the middle of a situation right now that is uncontrollable. It's beyond your circumstance. And what you're looking at, what you're facing is a giant. I, I don't know if David, you know, when he ran out, he probably had his eyes closed and his hands just raised to heaven because that's how Christians do it today, right? He was like, oh, Lord, I just thank you. Hey, God, you're awesome. No, that's not how it happened, right? He was looking dead at his enemy, but being confident that his mind was set on God and what God had already said. He was set in the fact that God had already proclaimed and declared a promise and a covenant with him. Years before him, he was confident in it. Because look at what the rest of that says. Not only did he fix his his thoughts or fix his eyes on that, it it says, uh, keep putting into practice all You learned and received from me everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I don't think for a minute from the scripture that I read about David facing Goliath that he was ever once anxious, scared, afraid. Anybody read that and get anything different out of it? If you do, don't have a conversation with me right now. Let's let's talk about it later, right? But I don't read that at all in scripture. And so, so many times what I do is I read that and I'm like, oh. I wish I was like David. I don't have any confidence. I don't have any peace. But am I putting into practice all that I've learned from him, all that I have received from him? Am I walking in that and everything that I've heard him do? In the last four years, I've preached to you guys approximately 200 times. Are you putting everything that you've heard God say from this pulpit into practice? Are you reflecting on it? The truth is, most of the time, I can't even remember next Sunday what I preached this Sunday. And if I'm the one that said it, I think most of us probably struggle with that too. We probably have some things that God has dropped into our life that we've completely forgot about. How many of you have ever went through a situation and you kind of have that spiritual deja vu moment? And you're like, I remember when God did this or God did that. Right? And all of a sudden there's something that wells up on the inside of you and you get excited again. But this is what David did. He continually kept practicing and learning and putting the word in his heart because in the old testament it said hide it says that david hid his heart or hid the word in his heart that he might not sin but it said to concentrate and read the command of the lord day and night never depart from it why so that in times of testing you can stand What we do is we come to church and want the pastor to pump us up and give us something awesome. And hopefully if the worship team gets just right and the bass drops just at that low decibel level and she hits that "Ah," high note, that's about as high as I can go. The spirit of God moves on me and it's going to give me power to get through the week. That's bull. You're lucky I didn't finish what I wanted to say. That is not what it's supposed to be. That's what we've made it in America today. That's what the modern church has made it is. This is what the pastor's job is. He's supposed to pump me up and give me everything that I need to carry me through my rough week. No. It's supposed to be a time when we come together and we celebrate all that God did for us in the week and it encourages us. Mm, Man, I want to scream. Because we've got it so jacked up. We are so off. Yes, we're supposed to teach. Yes, we're supposed to put these things into practice. The Bible says that we're supposed to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That's what my job is. When's the last time any of you sat in my office and asked me to equip you to do something in the church? Boom! (laughs) If I had a mic, I'd drop it. That's what it's supposed to be. But instead, what we want to do, man, this was not how it was supposed to come out. So I hope you're hearing this in the spirit. Because this is nothing that I put in my notes. Instead, what we do is we screw everything up and then call the pastor and ask him to pray for us. Can I come in for a counseling session, pastor? There's only one counselor. His name is Holy Spirit. (laughs) Mm. Gosh. Mm. (laughs) Help me get back to my notes, Lord. (laughs) I got in the game and I'm scared. (laughs) (laughs) I told you I'll do whatever you want me to do, say whatever you want me to say, but now I'm out there and I'm like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. So 
Let me move on uh, so I can get through the rest of these notes. Put it into practice. Let me, let me tell you, church, I may be saying this, and you may feel like I'm saying it at you, but I'm in the pew with you. I'm in the chair with you because i got to walk through this thing before I ever bring it to you. And so usually what happens is God gives me these words, and then he chops off all my toes as he's stomping on them, drags me across the coals, and reveals to me my insignificance and how broken and, and, and messed up I am, has me deal with my own sin, my own uh, insecurities, and then says, okay, out of this place now, I want you to speak to your people. So I hope that you never come to this church or watch online and think, oh, this pastor's coming from a place. He doesn't understand what it's like. Yeah, I do. You don't know what happens to me between Sundays. Get in the game at any level. Get in the game. I think it's pretty amazing. Sometimes we, you know, right now there's a lot of focus on a certain players in this year's Super Bowl. You know, and, and honestly, they're carrying a lot of weight because there's a, a big expectation on them, right? And I don't know about you, and I, I, don't, I didn't really take time to study this out, but I wonder, like, how did the army treat David after he just slayed a giant? Do you think their, their impression of him may have began to change? No, I know that they made songs about him and everything later, but that was later. I wonder what happened that day. The boy that brought the charcuterie board <laughs> of 10 cheeses and 10 loaves, right? <laughs> David was ahead of his time. He brought it to him, and they're like, oh, such a good little servant boy. Oh, Eliab, your brother's so cool. He's just the sweetest little thing. Oh, he just cut that dude's head off. <laughs> I mean, think about that. I, I don't know if I would ask him for another piece of cheese. Like, like what happens? <laughs> anyway, sorry, that my brain gets going. Get involved at any level. David was just being obedient to his father. He was just being obedient to his father, but there was something on the inside of him. There was enough practice, there was enough focus, there was enough holiness, if you want to call it, on the inside of David that when something rose up that was ungodly, he began to face it. With confidence, he, he went out and... I believe there had to be some courage. I believe there had to be some courage to go out and face Goliath. I, I heard it, that he was anywhere from six foot nine to like nine foot six. It just depends on who you believe and what you understand. He was a big dude. Let's just say that. He was a big dude. Much bigger than David. And one of the things that I got a new perspective of this when I was teaching kindergarten class downstairs in the basement with Tom Mears. How many of you remember Tom Mears? Yeah. Tom Mears, a lot of people would describe as a gentle giant. I don't know how tall he was. To me, he was about 6'4", 300 plus pounds, big, big man, huge hands, big feet, bigger heart. And we were teaching the Sunday school class, and we were doing David and Goliath. And we, we would act these things out like we'd march around the city, and we're trying to lead these little kids and do all, all kinds of different stuff in, in, in kids' church. That's what, <laughs> I fell in love with kids doing ch kids' church. Um, be careful what you ask for, because I said I wanted to work with youth, and they put me in the nursery. <laughs> we're changing those things now. It's not the same. Anyway, and so I was trying to, I was like, man, this is perfect. I could talk about David and Goliath. And I'll use one of these little four or five-year-old kids to face uh, Tom Mears, a giant. And I don't know, we had like 75 kids. Right? <laughs> Pentecostal preacher. We had like 75 kids. 90 of them gave their heart to the Lord. <laughs> no, but we, we had, I don't know, prob probably 10 kids, I'm guessing, around 10, 10 kids in there, boys and girls. And we're going, and I'm trying to build this story up, and I'm trying to make it all exciting for the kids. And I'm, I'm like, Tom, would you stand up and be Goliath? And Tom stood up, and he had a big old beard, and he's looking down on these boys. And he's like, you know, he's trying to act like a giant. And I'm talking to him, and I'm like, now, which one of you little guys wants to take on Goliath? This little dude jumped up out of his chair and jumped on Tom. And he was like, ah! 
I was like, oh, I was not expecting that at all, you know. And then once everyone else saw this little boy jump on David, they all jumped in. It was such a, a spiritual moment for me. I know it's funny now. But I was like, how much of the world is like that today? They're just waiting for one Christian David to stand up against Goliath, to give him some courage, to give him uh, something to go on, give him some confidence. And so I also believe that if we look at these last couple of scriptures, I need to, I need to close. If we look at these last couple of scriptures that I have for you, they had to fi- he, David had to fix his thoughts. He had to fix his thoughts on who God was. He had to put the stuff into practice. He didn't just go out for the first time and, and sling that uh, sling, slingshot. He had practiced that. He had done some things. He had done what God had showed him to do before. But then if we look at it, if we could take first, uh, first Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I believe David understood who he was because he had the promise that had come to him from Samuel. Said that he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. He wasn't king yet. He believed God in his word. God has spoken some promises and some prophecies to some of you, but you forgot about them. Just like I forgot about them. There's things that God has spoken to you and put deep in your heart, and you forgot about them. You've walked away from them. Because it's, maybe it's been a day. <laughs> you know, some of us are like, God's going to bless you. Okay, tomorrow? Next week? No, no, no. Sometimes it's years. Sometimes it's decades. He's giving us that so that we can keep searching after him, seeking after him, longing for him. But David believed this, that he was a royal priesthood, that he was a chosen people, a a holy nation. There we are. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Come out from among them. So many of us just walk around and, and we've never truly come out. Therefore, we've never really stepped out of darkness for the light to be revealed in us. We're trying to keep that thing hidden. And so I believe, even though this is in the New Testament, I believe David had an understanding of who God had called him, anointed him, and appointed him to be. And he could walk in confidence knowing that God said this about me, not that I did it for myself. Sometimes what happens is we mess ourselves up because we get so confident in our abilities that we lose confidence in God. I'm going to brag on Jenny for a little bit. She, she can sing. We were, <laughs> We went to a Toby Mac concert and Kirk Franklin concert one time and, and, uh, in Chicago. And they said, I want, I want to hear a girl that can sing. I don't want a girl that can sing. I want a girl that can sing it. I went, there she is. I started pointing at her. So just because you have a talent and a gift, there's too many Christians today watching The Voice and America's Got Talent and everything. Oh, they're so anointed. They can just sing. There's a difference. Just because they can hit that note, note, yeah, they may be anointed to sing that part, but they're not anointed by God. You understand? All gifts come from God, right? But it depends on how you use them, whether it's the anointing of God that's falling on it or just the anointing of the gift. There's a difference. And so that's why you've got some churches that are, that are growing and they're doing well because a pastor can stand up there and speak and he's anointed to speak, but the anointing of God's not on it. So let me go through this. We get into this place, we got we to understand these things so that the goodness of God can be revealed, which is my, closing, is my closing here. We need to understand these things. If we're, do, if we're doing these things, if we're in the valley of indecision, we said, okay, I'm going to jump into this thing. I want the blessings of God to flow. I want God to use me. And if all of our, all of our uh, motivation to do those things is so that we can get blessed or so that we can use our gifting, we're going to miss the mark. Because the motivation for the whole thing is so that God gets the glory. Everything that we do should be for the glory of God. If we look in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, if you can pull that one up. It says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more than what we might ask or think. This is a different version. I understand that. It's to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we can ask or think for his glory. For his glory. Are we wanting to get out of the valley of indecision for his glory? Or because we just don't like being stuck in that place? What's the reason that we're seeking those things? What's the reason that we're trying to get on the team? And I think that's where the church in America, or the modern church, I should say, has done such a poor job. Because we've sold so many people salvation tagged to blessings of God. 
You do receive blessings of God in salvation, but salvation doesn't bring the blessings. Does that make, I don't know if I said that right. What we think is, oh, if I come to the altar today and get saved, my credit cards get paid off, my debt get paid off, I get a husband and a wife and I have all the kids that I want and I get to drive a brand new car because the blessings of God are for me, right? All the riches, everything is God. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything is his and because now I'm his, woo, I'm going to walk in the blessings of God. Thank you that I'm saved. Are you glad that you're saved or are you glad that you think you're getting blessings? In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We need to walk in a confidence today. We, see, we have something that David never experienced. Jesus Christ, we have the account of Jesus Christ walking on earth, overcoming the world, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and now we too can walk in that same confidence that he already came and did it. David was a savior for Israel that day. Jesus is a savior for us today. David was a boy, unknown boy, sent to be a savior. Jesus was an insignificant little child sent at a time of desperation to save the world. We too can have the confidence that David had, but we have an experience. David just had a hope. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and his is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith is a gift from God. The, the, very, gift, the very gift from God that you have has the ability and the power to overcome the world. It's God's gift in you, working in you, that if you'll simply allow him to work, he will get the victory. He will overcome the world in your life, whatever that may be. Will you stand with me today? I hope that today on this Super Bowl Sunday, I hope you had some fun, but I also hope that you were challenged. I hope that there was, there was a, some inspiration there given that today, no matter what you're going through, that God wants to touch you, God wants to heal you, save you, give you victory in every area of your life, but you gotta make sure things are in right order. You gotta follow proper procedure, right? Some of you have worked in some places where you got some standard operating procedures like this is how it's done. And when you get those things out of order, there, there's usually a consequence for that. But today we, do, we don't understand that in, in the church world. We think as long as we got this last thing, no matter how we get there, like God's just going to bless it. God's going to multiply it. God's going to do what only God can do. No, he's still a God of order. He's still a God of reverence. He's still a God that we need to fear. That not fear like who cower down in fear that he, he's going to strike me dead. Cower down in, in fear than the reverence of who God is. How awesome and powerful he is. How much he loves us. The mercy and grace that's flowing. Will, will the prayer workers come forward? The altar workers come forward today? If you have a need for God to touch you in any area of your life, if you need him to intervene, we have, we have prayer workers. It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or this is the first time you're visiting. If you need a touch from God, I'm, I don't want to say I'm begging you, but I'm pleading with you today. Don't walk out the doors without giving him a chance to show you who he is, to reveal his power and his might. Today, maybe you've been in that valley of indecision. Maybe you've never decided to, to be a member of, of the army. Maybe you've just kind of been watching from a side. Maybe you've just been watching for a little bit, trying to figure out what's happening. Maybe, maybe you've been like David. Looking at the church, realizing they're cowering in fear, and like, well, why would I want to be a Christian if none of you are overcoming anything in your life? I want to tell you that today, God can overcome in your life. God is powerful. God is mighty. If you'll give him an opportunity, he'll show you just how wonderful and kind and powerful he is. Heavenly Father, today, I thank you. Lord, that in America we get to celebrate the Super Bowl Sunday. Lord, there, there's so many little testimonies that have been coming out of how you're moving in our country. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would move here in Decatur, Illinois, that same way, God. That you would touch us with your power and your presence, O oh God, Lord, that we would be humbled at, at, your, at your might and your power, your goodness and your love. But Father, I'm asking that today, Lord, regardless of who wins in the Super Bowl, Lord, that you would win in the hearts and the lives of people here today. Lord, I pray that anything that was said today would bring you glory and honor. And I pray, Lord, that lives would be changed, not because of my words, but because of your power and your might. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We ask, Lord, for a special blessing this afternoon upon the Chalmers family as we uh, celebrate Joe Chalmers' life. Lord, we thank you for the life that was given to us, the time that was here. And I thank you, Lord, that, that in the quarters of his life, in the game of life that he played, that he made the best decision ever, and that was to choose you as his head coach. 
that he followed after you, that he obeyed you. And today, Lord, he is celebrating and receiving his trophy. And Lord, we thank you for that today. I pray, Lord, that you'd be a blessing to that family. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that in the midst of pain and in the midst of grief, Lord, that you would somehow move and do what only you can do, bring comfort, peace, and joy to that family. Lord, I ask you to bless your people, watch over them, keep them safe. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. If you have need of anything for prayer,